Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. This is one of those times where a show is running late not because of a big project or something looming on the list that needs to be done, but because the show itself is that big project that's looming on the list and must be done. See, every now and then I put together some training and classes for my job, and every now and then those classes can be used as a basis for the show. After all, if I'm trying to teach librarians how to do something kind of technical, Well, that's the foundation of this podcast, isn't it? While we've covered this topic before, I have this opportunity that I'd like to take hold of and dive into a more in-depth discussion to take things to a next level. Whereas the first show on this topic was a sort of 101 level class, this is more of a 201 level class. We're not yet on the road to graduate degrees, my friends, if I may torture this metaphor just a little bit more, but we are digging deeper. And that's good, because digging deeper is one of those things that you need to do as part of this class, and now as part of this show. So one more time, let's talk about Minecraft. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 46, Minecraft for Librarians. I'm Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology, and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hey, how are you? Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the net, back on the feeds, on the fiber and the Wi-Fi, and we're coming at you from the deserts of Arizona, where... No joke, the temperature has been hitting a consistent average of over 115 degrees Fahrenheit with a spike at 118 a few days ago. Now, for those in the right-thinking metric system using parts of the world, that's between 46 to 47 degrees Celsius. It's an astronomical anomaly that, though the sun is 93 million miles away from the Earth, it's only just down the street and around the corner from Arizona. When the sun rises, this is the state where it starts. So that said, you might hear a ceiling fan in the back, you might hear the tinkle of ice cubes in a glass of iced tea, and you may well hear me hit the floor when the heat gets the better of me. We'll try and fix this up in post, okay? Right, so Minecraft. As I said in the intro, I had the opportunity to teach a class called Minecraft for Librarians, where I work, And I thought it'd be a cool topic for the show, too. Now, let me just say right now that if you're a Minecraft player, the kind of person who's digging branch mines, building sky castles, automating your farms with fantastic redstone contraptions, and you have a functional ranch with a few hundred head of cattle, then this probably isn't the show for you. But wait, 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 wait. Don't hit the skip button just yet. If this isn't the show for you, then it might be a show for someone you know. Especially if you're a biblio person who wants to do some Minecraft at your library, but your co-workers wouldn't know Minecraft from... from... from a hole in the ground? Wait, no, that doesn't sound right, but I'm going to roll with it. This is a show you might want to share with them to bring them up to speed on what Minecraft is on a basic level. How the game works, what do you do, and why it's so popular. I mean, sure, you could teach that class, but... Would you want to? Maybe you would. I don't know. But if you don't, then just point them to cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, and hey, I can do that for you. Meanwhile, we are going to cover the basics of the game, the world within the game, the interdimensionality of the nether and the end, and so much more. Now, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. A class on Minecraft as an overall thing would take hours. So, this is just something to offer up a little help to those who might need it. 
After all, not everyone has met Steve, nor have they been chased by a creeper. So, let's rectify that somewhat, shall we? And let's get started. So if we're going to talk about Minecraft, if we're going to do a little class, then we should probably set some goals and figure out what it is we hope to achieve. And we should also, you know, lay out what it is we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the history of the game. We're going to talk about game modes and the different kinds of games that you can play. We're going to talk about playing individually or on a server. We're also going to talk about people, places, and things, and in the world of Minecraft, this means mobs, biomes, and blocks and items. We're going to talk about creativity and building, we're going to talk about Minecraft and your library, and of course, I'm not going to leave you high and dry here. We're going to offer up some resources that you can use after the show is over and something that you can refer back to for help and maybe a little guidance too. So with that in mind... What's the goal? So, you know, what are you going to get out of this? Well, like I said, I'm not here to make a huge Minecraft nerd of you. I mean, if you were going to be a, a Minecraft nerd, chances are you would probably already be a Minecraft nerd by now. So the goal here is quite simple. It's to introduce people who haven't done anything with Minecraft except perhaps watch someone play it, um, introduce them to the game, and by the end of this, my goal is that you'll be able to have an intelligent conversation about the game and things within the game. Yep, that's that's about it, really. Uh, it's one of those things where when a kid or a teen comes up to you and talks to you about Minecraft during a Minecraft event at your library or something like that, you can actually understand what they're saying and what they're talking about. Even if you yourself have not played the game, you'll at least have some concept of what they're, what they're conversing about. So, okay. Let's start with a quick history. Because you kind of have to know where this thing came from to know how it ended up where it is as one of the most popular games of all time, if not the most popular game of all time. So, Minecraft began in 2009. It was created by a Swedish guy named Markus Persson, um, and you can uh, call him Notch, as most people do. That's N-O-T-C-H. You can follow him on Twitter, at Notch. Notch is a really cool guy. At least he seems to be. He seems to be pretty chill. Um, he's a developing fiend. He takes play, you know, he takes part in uh, coding tournaments and things like that, where sort of like one of those things where make a game in a day. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, gets him fired up. So this is a guy that really knows how to develop games and how to develop them, you know, from the ground up and kind of start with something and just build upon it. And Minecraft itself didn't come from nothing. It wasn't just forged out of the ether. It's inspired by some other games like Dwarf Fortress, Infiniminer, and Dungeon Keeper. Now, Dwarf Fortress is sort of a simple exploration-based thing, and Infiniminer itself looks a lot like Minecraft, except it doesn't have the sort of Dungeons & Dragons elements to it that uh, Minecraft does, and we'll talk more about that in a few. And Dungeon Keeper is this weird sort of administrative game where you're not really, you know, the torturer or warden of a dungeon so much as you are the person who's just running it. I mean, it's almost an administrative work game. Um, so there's elements of that to the uh, to Minecraft as well. Minecraft was officially released in November 2011. Um, it was in you know alpha and beta releases before that, which basically means that people were able to play the game before it was considered a finished product. And boy, oh boy, play it, they did. Um... It became the best-selling PC game of all time. Over 23 million copies have been sold worldwide. Minecraft isn't so much a game 
as it is a phenomenon. I mean, it just exploded onto the scene. And now there's Minecraft toys. I believe there's a Minecraft movie on the way. There are different kinds of Minecraft game because now you have Minecraft story mode, which is a different game from regular Minecraft. Uh, it's it's just its own sort of phenomenon that just overtook uh, gamers by storm. And we'll talk about why here in a few minutes as well. Uh, one of its strengths also is that it's available almost everywhere. Uh, Minecraft can be played on Windows, Mac OS, Xbox 360, Xbox One, the Wii U, the PS3, the PS4, iOS, Android, and Fire OS. If they could figure out a way to put Minecraft on an Apple Watch, they might actually consider it. Um, but that's great because what this means is you don't have to be limited to playing Minecraft on your Windows PC or on your Mac. Um, if you don't even have a computer, but you happen to have a gaming console like a PlayStation and an Xbox, uh, you can play Minecraft there. You can play Minecraft on the go. Um, personally, I have Minecraft on almost every computer I own. I have it on a Windows machine. I have it on this very Mac that I'm recording the podcast on. I don't really play it on the consoles. Um, I do have an Xbox One and a PS3, but I don't really play it on that. I prefer the keyboard and mouse experience. But I do have it on my iPad and my iPhone because every now and then I just like to fiddle around with it on the go. So yeah, Minecraft is available almost everywhere and that's part of its strength. It means that anyone can kind of get into the game with what they have and on their own terms. So talking about the game a little bit deeper, the object of the game, because games are supposed to have objects, right? You know. So what's the object of Minecraft? Well, it doesn't have one. See, the game is what the player makes of it. Um, if you want to just be an explorer and go out into the world and fight monsters and just gather resources so you can just fight monsters all day long, you can do that. If you want to build massive castles that float in the sky, you can do that. If you want to do both, well, you can do that too. You can dig mines, you can make sky castles, you can build lighthouses, you can build vast underwater cities, if you like. Um, that's, that's kind of what you want to do. This is one of the reasons that Minecraft is so popular, because it doesn't have, it's, it's not one of those games that just doesn't have a linear progression that you can play through as you want at your own time. Minecraft is just there to be played with. It's what's called an open world sandbox game. Now, there are other games that are kind of like this, but Minecraft sort of takes it a step farther. When one thinks of a sandbox game, a, uh, a title that comes up often is something like Grand Theft Auto, where sort of after you beat the first mission that's, that's more or less a tutorial that introduces you to the game and how the game works, you're kind of on your own. You can play through the game at your at your leisure. You can do the missions as you want, or you can just steal cars and shoot people or whatever it is you want to do in the game. You don't have to play the game straight through. Um, but if you want to beat it, you do. Right? Sooner or later, you got to go do missions, and then you've got to you know, play through the story and get through the game. Minecraft really doesn't have that. It Well, it does isn't it? and it doesn't. See... We're going to talk about this later on, but there was an addition to Minecraft a, you know, a while ago now called The End, and it's basically a boss level, and it was put there for people who did want to beat the game. But you could play through Minecraft for years and never go to the end and never fight the sort of quote-unquote final boss. So it's it's very open. It's that It's that open game that allows you to do sort of whatever you want, and that's kind of unique as far as video games go. Now, Minecraft also has a day and a night cycle, and this becomes important with the uh, the monsters that we'll talk about later. One full day is 20 minutes. Daytime itself lasts 10 minutes. Sunset and sunrise last one and a half minutes apiece, and nighttime is seven minutes. So this day and night cycle is important to the rhythm of the game, and it makes the world seem more real in and of itself. So, okay, let's talk about game modes and difficulties. Now, these might sound like sort of the same thing, but they are a little different. See, there are three game modes, survival, creative, and hardcore. 
Now, in survival, you're searching for resources. You're crafting things, building stuff. You have experience levels that you can use for things like enchanting items and things like that. You will have to deal with hunger because in Minecraft you get hungry, and if you start going hungry, you start losing health and you will die of hunger, uh, which also brings me back to health. You have to manage your health bar. Things can kill you. Um, so yeah, that's survival. The creative mode is really a safe place to play when you just want to build massive things and don't want to go through the bother of mining stuff to do it. See, mining is kind of hard work. I mean, obviously you're just clicking a mouse, so it's not like hard physical work, but it takes time. And for me, that's part of the fun. But sometimes, you know, I just want to dump out the entire box of Legos and play with whatever I've got. And if I want to build a gigantic castle in the sky, I can do that. If I want to build that underwater lighthouse that, you know, juts above the horizon and, you know, towers into the air, I can do that. Uh, creative gives you all of the stuff and you even have the ability to fly freely around your world, which is great if you're building large scale things. You can just fly up and start placing blocks and building things. And finally, hardcore. Everything is difficult, and if you die, your world goes with you. In other words, if you die, the world that you created and all your stuff and everything in that world is removed from the game. So that's why it's called Hardcore. So, okay, beyond that, there's four difficulty settings. And this goes back to the Hardcore because, like I said, everything is hard, and that is a difficulty setting. There's Hard, Normal, Easy, and Peaceful. Now, in Peaceful... You can mine for resources, but there's no dangerous bad guys out there to get you. Now, you can still die in a peaceful environment, even if you are, you know, even if there are no bad guys to kill you, because it's still survival. You're still searching for resources. You're still crafting. You don't have to deal with hunger so much. However, if you go swimming in lava, you'll die. If you fall from a great height, you will die. If you drown, you'll die. So you can still die, but it's usually your own fault when you do. So, okay, that's peaceful. In easy mode, there are monsters, but they're pretty easily dealt with and there's not so many of them. In the normal mode, there are monsters. They're a little harder to kill and there's more of them. And then in hard mode, it's more of the same, plus even more than that, you're going to die. It's just a matter of when. So, okay, that's the difficulties and the modes. So the modes sort of decide what the world is like and the difficulties decide what the monsters are like, if that's, you know, if that helps you figure out what's going on. So, okay, let's, let's talk about playing a game. Minecraft offers the player a single or multiplayer experience. Now, Basically, there's three levels to this. There's individual play or local play, which is just you're sitting on a computer. You are playing Minecraft by yourself. There is no one else in your Minecraft world except you and the monsters and things like that. So there's no other people that are bouncing around your world, either you know playing with you or just playing alongside of you or stuff like that. Then there's the online server. The online server is a server that's out on the internet, sometimes on the open internet, that you can connect up to and play with sometimes hundreds of other people. Um, if you ever get bored and you you know don't want to play Minecraft on your own, just hop on YouTube and do some searching around. You will find that some of these servers are amazing in what has been done. People have created cities, honest to God, cities. So, yeah, and uh, there's one out there I think that uh, that has the Game of Thrones uh, world of Westeros sort of recreated in Minecraft. I mean, when you can build anything you want and you basically have unlimited resources available to you, well, some people build anything they want. Finally, there's a local server. If you're playing at home with friends and maybe you, you know, all have a computer or something like that, someone can set up a server just by opening up their opening up a new game and then opening that game up to a LAN. In other words, the local area network where the people that are there right now on that local network can join in the game too. So that's a local server. It's not out on the internet. It's just sort of right there in the house, but all of you can play in the same world. Okay. So speaking of the world of Minecraft, 
the world of Minecraft is absolutely huge. Um, sort of famously, and I say famously because sometimes it's proclaimed in the title screen of the game, the world of Minecraft is about eight times the surface of the Earth. So picture the surface of the Earth and multiply it by eight, and now you have some idea how big Minecraft is. It is absolutely massive. It's procedurally generated. In other words, the world is sort of built for you as you walk. So as you move through the world, it creates itself in front of you and sort of unmakes itself behind you. Now, what has been created remains, unless, of course, you start altering it. Um, so if you turn around and go back, you'll see the things that were there before. But as you walk forward into new territories, things are built for you on the fly. And what this means is no two games are alike. So not only do you have this massive world to explore, but you can start another game and you have another massive world to explore that is likely nothing like your first world. So yeah, that's that's kind of cool. This is another draw for Minecraft because if you're not really going to get bored with the with the gaming world every time you start up a new game, you get a different world. You get a substantially different world. Minecraft itself holds a world record in a sort of roundabout way, as there's a YouTuber out there called Kurt J. Mack who holds the Guinness World Record for most distance traveled in Minecraft. He's been walking since 2011. We'll talk about him a little later, but yeah, it's you know a record-holding game for just moving around in Minecraft. And it has tons of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in Minecraft that we're going to talk about. But the important thing to remember about that stuff is all of it has a purpose. So there's really nothing in Minecraft that's useless. There are some things that are more useful than others, for sure. But there's nothing that you come across that cannot be used for something. And finally, in a world that big, you've got to expect that Minecraft has a huge diversity of places for you to go. So let's take a few minutes and take a closer look at those places in the massive world of Minecraft. When it comes to places in Minecraft, you have the big and the small. Working from the big first, you have to understand that there are three overarching dimensions in Minecraft. And these are basically like other worlds, so you essentially have three different worlds to explore. And if that's not enough, there are 63 distinct biomes in Minecraft. So to talk about the dimensionality first, there, the first of the three dimensions that you're always going to encounter when you start a new game is the overworld. The overworld is sort of the place that everything happens first. So when you get dumped into your new game of Minecraft, you're going to be looking at a world that's somewhat familiar. It's got trees. It's got grass. There are hills. There's dirt. There are caves, waterfalls, things like that. It's the world that you kind of expect to see when you look at a game of Minecraft. But you need not stay there, because the overworld is vast, but it is only one of three. The other world that was added later in the game's development was the Nether. Now, the Nether is basically, for all intents and purposes, hell. There are lots of lava lakes, uh, lava waterfalls, or lava falls, I guess? Yes, I suppose so. Um, and there is no sky in the Nether. So where the overworld has a usually beautiful blue sky with some fluffy clouds floating through it, the nether has no sky. You are underground. Period. End of sentence. The reason for the differences, though, is with the nether, they were able to introduce new block types, new stuff. This is how they sort of created a new place for players to go, and there were new things there to get. So, overworld? where you start, where everything sort of looks normal. The nether, where you can go after you've built what is called a nether portal and looks a lot like hell. And finally, the end. 
Now, the end is the newest of the dimensions, and it was created to give players the opportunity to quote unquote beat the game. Now, I put that in quotes because you never have to go there. It's actually kind of a pain to get into the end. It basically requires you to go on a quest. And I don't mean a quest that is fulfilled in a couple of hours of gameplay. I mean, it's going to take you some time. You could be at this a few days just to gather up the things that you need to open up a portal to the end. Now, while the overworld is normal and the nether is hell, the end is sort of the void. Things are dark there. It's very dark. Um, the landscape is mostly barren and green. There are strange dark towers. And if you fall off the edge of the world, you fall out into nothingness. You could liken the end to the void. So, yeah, that's the, that's the third dimension and also fairly big. So within the overworld, there are biomes. And biomes are different and distinct ecological and environmental habitats that have their own characteristic geography, weather, flora, and fauna. As I said before, there's a lot of stuff in Minecraft, and some of that stuff is alive. So we're talking trees and plants and reeds and bunnies and cows and stuff like that. So each biome has its own mixture of these things that make it what it is. There are five major divisions of biome, though. These are snowy, cold, medium lush, dry warm, and oceanic. So to just give you a kind of overview of these without going into all of them, because that would take an entire show and would probably be really boring, let's just highlight a few in each. So snowy biomes always have a cover of snow at all times, and it actively snows there. So if you spawn into a world or something like that, and you look around and you see nothing but snow, you're in a snowy biome. So some examples of these snowy biomes include an ice plain, and an ice plain is sort of like Kansas after a blizzard. They're fairly flat ground, maybe some small rolling hills, but covered completely in snow. Another one is the cold taiga, which is basically a giant redwood forest that also has a snow covering. These giant redwood forests are great because the trees are massive and wood is a commodity you really have to have in Minecraft. So if you happen to get into one of these taigas or cold taigas, yeah, you, you've hit jackpot when it comes to wood. And finally, for snowy biomes, at least in this case, Frozen River, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's a river that's rolling out to the sea or a larger body of water, and it's ice. The water will freeze into ice. There might be water below the ice, um, but the top of the river itself is frozen, and yes, you can walk on it. In Minecraft, you can walk on icy rivers. So yeah, that's just some examples of the snowy biomes. For the cold biomes, they may or may not have snow cover, but the snow cover isn't always there. Um, you'll see some snow, you'll see some rain, and, you know, but they can be lush and green as well. Uh, one of the cold biomes is extreme hills, and extreme hills are just basically mountains. Uh, these can be several... As far as the character is concerned, these things are hundreds, if not thousands of feet high. So these are great big mountain type structures. Uh, they might even have snow caps on them. So that's a cold biome example is the extreme hills. You've also got the stone beach, which, like I said, is a bit self-explanatory. It's like a beach, but instead of sand, you have a lot of stone. Uh, this, too, is awesome because stone is a popular thing to have in Minecraft, too. Then there's the taiga, and the taiga, like the cold taiga, is just a giant redwood forest, per se, but this one doesn't have the snow covering, so this is just your giant redwood forest. In the realm of medium and lush biomes, there's the plains, which, you know, imagine Kansas, except without the blizzard conditions, some small rolling hills, but mostly flat level ground. There are forests, and there's different kinds of forests, and different kinds of forests have different kinds of trees and different kinds of animals. So there are some small forests, there are the bigger forests like the taiga, the taiga is a forest in and of itself, and there's also jungles. Now jungles, like I said, have their own kinds of trees and their own kinds of weather, because in a regular forest, it might be fairly good weather throughout the 
throughout most of the game cycle, but in a jungle, it rains quite often. So, yeah, if if you're looking around, you see lots and lots of trees with maybe some little ponds here and there, and it's raining every day, you're probably in a jungle. On the dry, warm side, you have deserts, which I think we all know what we're talking about, especially when it comes to those of us who live in Arizona. Deserts are lots and lots of sand with some cacti and maybe a little scrub bush here and there. Then there's the savanna, so picture, you know, sort of the Serengeti. There are, you know, sort of level ground with occasional outcroppings and mountains and stuff like that with different kinds of trees, tall grass, and things like that. And then there's mesas. Now, mesas are sort of like painted deserts, and in my opinion, they're one of the most beautiful landscapes in Minecraft. Uh, beautiful rock formations that that basically rise up to plateaus. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous, especially if you sort of happen across one by accident, just as you're wandering around, it just sort of appears in the distance. Beautiful, beautiful landscape that I've ever seen in any video game. And finally, the oceanic biomes. Now, the oceans in Minecraft can be absolutely massive as well. So you'll have continents and you'll have massive oceans between them. Now, you can swim. Swimming in Minecraft is pretty easy. You do have to keep holding down the space bar, otherwise you will sink as you move forward. But you can also do things like build a boat, and boats let you cross water a lot faster than swimming will. So, yeah, building a boat, not a bad idea, especially when you come across a large body of water that you cannot see land on the other side, because it could very well be that there is no land on the other side for quite some way to go. So now that we've talked about the big picture, sort of working down from the dimensions to the biomes and now to a more up close and personal look at the world, we need to talk about blocks because in Minecraft, the world is made of blocks. If it's not moving, it's a block. Simple as that. So in Minecraft, everything is a block. The Dirt is a block. The rock is a block. Even the reeds are blocks. Things that don't look like blocks are probably blocks, like I said, if it's not moving. For the most part, gravity is ignored, so you can sort of hang blocks in the air. Now, you can't just put a block in the sky, but you could build a small tower, say three blocks high, and then put a block on the end of that so it's jutting out to space, and then tear down the tower, and that block will still be hanging there just like something out of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, you'll actually hear Minecraft players refer to those as Mario blocks, where they're just sort of hanging there in midair. There are some blocks that do obey the laws of gravity, like sand and gravel, but, you know, for the most part, you can, you can put things in midair. That's why you can have these gigantic floating sky castles. That's kind of cool. Now, there are different block types, four of them, actually. There's natural, naturally created, structural blocks, and then the blocks from other dimensions. Natural blocks are blocks that naturally form as you walk forward. They are created by math and the world of Minecraft itself. Naturally created blocks are a little bit different. Naturally created blocks are blocks that can happen um, on their own when things form them. And the easiest way to think about this is a block called cobblestone. Pretty much any time you mine uh, stone, you'll get cobblestone. And that's fine. That's just how that works. Cobblestone is great. You can build pretty much anything you want out of cobblestone. But cobblestone can be naturally created too in circumstances where you have, say, a lava fall running into a water, a uh, body of water or a waterfall or something like that. Um, the mixing of those two things creates natural cobblestone. Structural blocks come from structures that also generate in the world of Minecraft. Some biomes have their own structures that may or may not generate within them. Jungles have temples. There are massive underwater temples as well. There are witches' huts and swamps and things like that. And these sort of have some of their own blocks that make those up that are sort of unique to what they are. And they're pretty cool looking. That's why people sort of value those blocks. They're rare, but they're pretty. So, yeah. And then there's blocks from other dimensions. And these are blocks like uh, soul sand from the nether and glowstone, which also comes from the nether. Then there's purple blocks, which come from the end. 
These are blocks that do not appear in the Ofo world. You have to go other places to get your hands on them. Or, of course, you just have to play in creative, and then they're there for you to use. Some blocks have spatial advantages. Many are just blocks. Uh, an example of this is glowstone. A glowstone block, as you might expect, glows. So it can be used as a source of light. Soul sand from the nether slows down anything that walks on it, except for zombie pigmen. I seem to recall that's the case. We'll talk about zombie pigmen here in a few minutes. But soul sand will slow you down for sure as you walk across it. But for the most part, blocks are blocks. You can build stuff out of blocks. And for much of it, you're looking at an aesthetic choice rather than something that's more functional, at least at the outset. There are tons of blocks in Minecraft. I'll have links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian slash podcast to a page on my website that has a lot of resources in it. And one of those resources is the official Minecraft wiki that you can go to and get an image that shows you all of the blocks in Minecraft. And there's a ton of them. So yeah, you can look through that at your leisure and just sort of explore what is out there, what it looks like and what it might be used for. So now that we've more thoroughly explored the world from the top down, from dimensions down to what it's made out of, well, let's talk about how we can make things out of what the world is made out of. And to do that, we're going to get into items. Items are things that manipulate the world in some way. These can include materials, food, tools, weapons, armor, transportation, potions, and music discs. And if I might have a quick tangent here, I want to talk about the music of Minecraft just for a second because I think it's absolutely fantastic. The music is done by a German artist called C418 or C418. I'm not exactly sure how that's supposed to be styled, but... I've called him C418 ever since I've heard of him, so I guess I'm kind of stuck there. C418's music is not there to distract from the game or to drive you on in the game. It's not that kind of video game music. The music is very atmospheric. It adds ambiance to the game. It's almost part of the environment, and I think that's why I find it so beautiful and lovely. It's the kind of music that I would probably play in between sections of this show, to be perfectly honest. In the show notes at Cyberpunk Librarian slash podcast, you will find uh, some links to playlists of C418's Minecraft music on Spotify. I, I really suggest check it out because it's the kind of music that's not only lovely to listen to, but it's the kind of music you might listen to when you're trying to get something done or you're trying to get nothing done at all and you're just having a relaxing day. So good stuff there. So music discs, they're a thing you can have and they, uh, they can be played at any time as long as you have a music player. So, okay, items, that's, that's a thing. And items are made out of the raw materials of the world. And most items need to be crafted. And of those, most all of them need a crafting table. So when any player starts a game of Minecraft, sort of their first thing that they need to do is survive their first night. Because when you start in Minecraft, you really have nothing. You have no armor, you have no items, you have nothing. You have what is before you in the world as laid out to you. So the first thing that most anyone will do is go punch some trees and get some wood because you knock down trees to get raw wood. And then after you get the wood, you use the wood to make planks, and from there you can start making things like sticks and wooden picks that you can use to get rock that make better picks, and all of that. But before you do much of anything of that, you typically get the wood, you typically turn the wood into planks, and then you use the planks to make a crafting table. And the crafting table allows you to make bigger things. It's the, easily the second thing that most people build in Minecraft, if it's not the first, because you have to have wood to get it. So yeah, crafting table, that's, that's a necessity. You'll see it all the time. Players will typically have several of them. They might carry a couple on them. However, they've set up their world. If they've got a house or, you know, a large mine or something, they'll just have crafting tables wherever so they can just 
bounce over to one real quick and make a thing. So yeah. So what is crafting, though? So Minecraft is a makerspace of sorts, at least in a uh, sort of odd Minecraftian way. Raw materials are used to make better things. And the raw materials, of course, come from the world around you. And these raw materials can be transformed into finished items through crafting. Now, crafting in and of itself is a whole thing that we're not going to get into because that's a show in and of itself. I mean, there are literally books on crafting. You can find them in the resources. So where did these materials come from? Well, like I said, from the world around you, from mining. And you'll find that people have created these massive structures out of finished materials. And not only did they put in the time to go get the resources, they put the time into crafting those resources into better, more exotic and useful things. So, okay, that's that's what items can get you. Items basically, as I said, manipulate the world and you can do things with them. Items are typically carried around with you or stored somewhere on whatever premises you might have, whether it's a small house or a gigantic mansion. But in the giant world of Minecraft, you should never feel lonely because you are not alone. There are things around you, and some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and some of them are very bad. And in the world of Minecraft, these are called mobs. Mobs are the creatures in the world that aren't you or other players. So, yeah, if you look around and you see something moving and it's not another player, that's a mob. And there are different kinds of mobs. There are passive, neutral, hostile, boss, tameable, and utility mobs. Now, a passive mob can be categorized as, I didn't even notice you there. A passive mob will not attack you ever. Even if you attack it, it will run from you. It will not attack you. A neutral mob isn't quite the same. A neutral mob is sort of, don't bother me and I won't bother you. But as soon as you attack it, it's going to turn hostile. And hostile means it's desperately seeking your demise. And there are mobs that are always hostile. We'll talk a little bit more about this in depth. So passive, neutral, and hostile, and then boss. Boss mobs are hostile mobs that not only are desperately seeking your demise, but are quite capable of causing it in a very short amount of time. Tameable mobs are things that you can tame and use. So yeah, these there are things in the Minecraft world that you can use to your advantage and that are desirable to have. Finally, a utility mob is something that you can build. It's a sentient thing that can help you do other things. So to kind of give you some examples, a passive mob might include a bat or a squid or a bunny or a chicken. These are you know, some standard wildlife kind of things that don't attack you. They will never attack you. You can attack them and they will run away or they won't do anything. So if you go and kill a chicken, well, the chicken will not fight back. Same with bunnies and squids and stuff like that. So passive mobs can also offer up raw materials. From chickens, you can get feathers and eggs. From squids, you get ink. Just, you know, as a couple examples there. Neutral mobs include things like giant spiders. Now, a giant spider is kind of a weird thing because a giant spider, as the name implies, is a large spider that's as big as you. But what its mood is sort of depends on where it's at. Because in the dark, giant spiders turn angry and then they become hostile. But if it's the middle of the day and everything is daylight and sunbeams, giant spiders really don't care about you until you attack them. Then they will come after you because you attacked them. Another example is the sort of Enderman uh, entity that resides within the Minecraft world and is currently the only entity that I know of that inhabits all three dimensions. You will find Enderman in the overworld, you will find them in the end, and you will find them in the nether. That's a fairly new addition that they are now appearing in the nether. So Endermen are tall black figures that won't really do much of anything to you unless you attack them or unless you stare at them. Then they get antsy and will come after you. And another example of a neutral mob is that zombie pigman that I mentioned earlier. Zombie pigmen are... 
it's pretty much exactly like they sound. They're gigantic, no, not gigantic, but they're man-sized pigs that walk around on two legs that hold a golden sword and look partially decayed like a zombie. They have no ill will against you, and I do specify the word they because they travel in packs. The, uh, the thing to remember about a zombie pigman, though, is if you attack it, the entire pack will come after you. So while you could probably easily fight off five of them, fighting off 15 of them might be a different story. So yeah, that's an example of neutral mob. Hostile mobs include things like the skeletons and the zombies, and of course, the iconic creeper. Now, skeletons are armed with bows and arrows, so they can hit you from a distance. Zombies are dumb, shambling enemies that really can't do anything to you unless they get close enough to you to touch you. And the creeper. If you don't know what the creeper is, I'm sure you've seen it on Minecraft something or other someplace. But the creeper is a strange little animal that can sneak up behind you and then blow up. Yes, it blows itself up. It kills itself to kill you. But that's the thing, you see, because when it explodes... It blows up whatever you might have been working on at the time. And as their name implies, they creep. They're almost completely silent until they get right behind you and then you'll hear a and then they explode and either blow you up or blow up whatever you're working on. Both is, you know, the thing that's going to happen for sure. And it may or may not kill you. A, a, a creeper attack might not kill you if you're at full health, but it all kind of depends on the circumstances. They do have a nasty habit of showing up whenever you really, really do not need a creeper at that point. So yeah, those are hostile mobs that are always after you, trying to kill you no matter what. Now you do get a sort of re you know, a rest from these things, because during the day, skeletons and zombies burn in daylight. So at night, these things come out to play. Anytime it's dark. So it doesn't even have to be night. If you're in a forest where there are trees all around and it's sort of dark there, if it's got enough darkness, you will see zombies and creepers and skeletons. They'll, they'll just show up there because it's dark enough. Um, you'll also see them in caves for the same reason. There are, there is no sun in a cave. So you will find skeletons and zombies and creepers in caves because it's dark. Now, like I said, the zombies and the skeletons will burn in daylight. I didn't say anything about the creepers there, did I? And that's because the creepers don't burn in daylight. During the day, there are creepers wandering about until about noontime, and then they will finally sort of go away until the night falls. So just because day shows up and all those zombies and skeletons are burning and you're giggling to yourself, ha ha ha, you get yours, that's when a creeper sneaks up behind you and blows you to kingdom come. Boss mobs, of which there are only two, are big bad enemies. Uh, the sort of first boss mob was the Ender Dragon. If you want to beat the game of Minecraft, you have to kill the Ender Dragon. It's a big dragon-like thing. I mean, it's a black dragon that's got glowing purple eyes, looks pretty cool, especially considered it, you know, it's made out of blocks like you would find in Minecraft. The other boss mob is a thing called the Wither that is a three-headed floating skeleton thing that's kind of terrifying. And yeah, that thing, I, to be honest, I'd rather go up against an Ender Dragon. I think it's, I think it's easier to fight. So those are two of the boss mobs. Tameable mobs are animals that you can turn to your own desires and can help you out in certain circumstances. So of these, there are wolves, horses, and ocelots. And you can tame them through various methods. For a wolf, you can feed them bones, and you get bones by killing skeletons. If you give a wolf enough bones, it learns to love you, and it becomes a dog. With an ocelot, you can give it uncooked fish, and you get fish by fishing. No big shock there. If you give an ocelot enough uncooked fish, it learns to love you and becomes a cat. With a horse, you can climb up on it and try and ride it. If you don't get bucked off and you eventually tame the horse, you now have a tame horse that you can throw a saddle on and ride it over land. So kind of like a boat is to large swaths of ocean, a horse is to large tracts of land. It gives you the opportunity to cover a large amount of land in a short amount of time. 
Finally, there's the utility mob. Now, the utility mob is a little special in that these are semi-sentient beings that you craft like you would an item. So of these, there are two. There's the iron golem and the snow golem. And they kind of serve similar purposes in that they help protect you and others around you. Iron golems are typically found around villages, and they help protect the village from things like zombies and stuff like that. Snow golems can sort of inhabit an area, and they will throw snowballs at things that are also trying to attack you. So it's not very powerful, but you know, you've got a horde of skeletons or something bearing down on you. It's nice to have a friend that can throw snowballs and knock out a few of them as you're fighting them off as well. So utility mobs are just that. They're there for a utilitarian purpose. They're not very smart. I mean, these are not player characters. These are things that are controlled by the game. But they do come in handy occasionally. Now, one of the really cool things about Minecraft is that it's very frequently updated. And some of these updates, as you might expect, are just utility-type things. They're fixing bugs, they're tweaking things here and there as needed, but they often add new things, new features, stuff that was not there before. The original Minecraft, when it started out, did not have 63 biomes. There were no three overarching dimensions. I, I remember when the Nether was added, and I remember when the End was added. These are new, newer things. And of the uh, new stuff, you might start seeing new mobs here and there as you move around in your world. There were a couple new things added recently, one of which I think is the cutest thing ever, are polar bears. I love polar bears. They're just awesome. Uh, so there are polar bears in Minecraft now, uh, and not only that, there are polar bear cubs. And, you know, for something that's made out of blocks, they're incredibly cute. I don't know exactly how dangerous they are yet because I've not run into one. I can't wait. I have a feeling that I might get killed. I really don't know if a polar bear is a hostile mob. I haven't looked into it because I kind of want to be surprised. So there's polar bears, but there's also things like skeleton horses, which are fairly new. And skeleton horses is a pretty apt description of what this is. It's the kind of thing you might see death riding astride of in a, you know, Minecraft horror movie or something like that. But they look kind of cool, and it's stuff like that that keeps the game fresh. And see, if I had to make a guess as to why Minecraft has become so popular and how it retains that popularity, it's just that. It's the fact that the world of Minecraft changes. New things show up on a fairly regular basis. Every three or four months, you'll see something that's new and exciting and something that's changed in the world around you. Minecraft's world evolves and grows. And as much as I like games like, say, Grand Theft Auto or some of the Call of Duty games, the thing about those games is three years from now, I will go back and I will play that game. I will pop it in the console of my choice and bring it up. And it's the same exact world as it was when I left it. I've been playing Minecraft since it was in beta and the world has changed significantly. So I think one of the reasons the game has held on and been so popular for so long, even among people like me who have been playing this game for years, and people who are brand new to it and haven't ever touched it before today, is that the world changes. And we don't know what's going to happen next. So we better stick around and find out. And that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in and for hanging on for it was a much longer show than what we normally do around here. And hey, if you already kind of knew all the stuff I was talking about in this episode, well, you might pass it off to someone who this is new for. Because after all, we're not all Minecraft players. And especially if you're going to do some Minecraft-related events at your library, you're probably going to have one or two co-workers that just haven't played the game. They're not into that kind of thing. But through this, they might be able to hold a conversation about it with some of the people that come in and want to play the game or some people who might come to the event. Either way, I hope it's helpful either for you or someone that you might know.
The song you're currently digging on is Moon Sun by Fascinating Earthbound Objects. You heard music from them throughout the entire show, and you can pick them up in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, or you can also find a link to the opening track, which as always is Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryo Miyashita. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. I'd like to thank them for doing all that they do for saving and preserving the Internet and all kinds of great content to be had over there. From the audio from NASA missions to classic video games to video archives, they've got some really great stuff over at archive.org. Check them out and you know show your appreciation. If you got a few bucks to donate to the uh, to the archive, I really suggest you do so. It's a great organization. They're doing some important work, and hey, they're hosting shows like this and shows that are not like this at all. If you'd like to connect with me online, I have got a myriad of ways to do so. You can hit us up at facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian, where I occasionally post a little something about the show and stuff about cyberpunk culture and things like that. If you prefer to get your audio in a video form, you can pick us up on youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian. The video that is the audio of this audio typically goes live just soon after the RSS feed gets updated. I have to push a couple buttons to make that happen. So if you don't see it right away, give me about 30 to 40 seconds. It's usually about that quick. So yeah, youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian and facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian are the best places to pick me up. But if you want to communicate directly, I heartily suggest you do so. On Twitter, I am at librarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian that it starts with a B. And you can also hit me up on google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. Or if you want to just send me a plain old fashioned email, well, I'm cyberpunk librarian at gmail.com. And with that, it's just about time to get out of there. I thank you for tuning in. I will see you next time on the next episode of the show. And hey, before we get out of here, it is my duty to remind you that you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there. I'll see you next time.